Can I have the ushers come forward for tonight's offering? Well, you don't need me to pray. <laughs> Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you for this offering on this blessed Christmas Eve. May this uh, offering be used for your service. Amen. My student came running to me one evening. Master, have you seen the new star? It only just appeared, he guessed. I hadn't been in my observatory in days, so I was startled to hear his report. Slow down, boy. What are you yammering about? I scolded. He repeated his fantastical news. Then he asked, What does it mean, Master? I stood up, rubbing my stiff back. First of all, if there is a star, if, 
then I must see it. Then and only then will I be able to determine its importance, I said. I was resolved to remain calm and not jump to conclusions. I didn't believe the impetuous boy had seen anything, but still, hope welled up within me. We made our way up the steep hill to my observatory. <clears throat> the boy chanting, chatting and questioning all the time. When we got there, I climbed the steps and looked out of the window. And there, on the western horizon, was the brightest star I had ever seen. I staggered backwards and fell into my student's arms. What does it mean, he asked. I can only, it can only mean one thing. A great king has been born. It took my colleagues and me almost two years to gather everything and make our journey. We traveled west with the star guiding us. At last, we arrived in Jerusalem and paid a visit to the sovereign, Herod. He asked the purpose of our visit. He didn't know about the birth of the new king, but seemed eager for any news that, he, that we could bring him. As we left the palace, the star appeared over a small town just outside of Jerusalem. We followed it until it stopped over the house in Bethlehem, where the child was. We knocked at the door, and a beautiful young woman with a chubby toddler opened it to us. She saw our strange clothing and took a step back. Don't be alarmed, good woman, I said. We are here to pay homage to the child. Then she relaxed and smiled and asked us in as though she had been expecting us. When in, <clears throat> we went in and began opening our gifts of gold, frankincense, and mirth. We dropped to our knees and worshiped the child. When we left, a heavenly messenger warned us not to report to Herod because he was seeking to destroy the child. So we went another way to our home.
frankincense to offer have I incense owns a deity nigh prayer and praising all men raising worship him God on high Myrrh is mine it's bitter perfume breathes a life of gathering gloom sorrowing sighing bleeding dying sealed in the stone cold tomb King Herod, even the name inspires fear. My subjects felt it. They trembled when I made my edicts. With a wave of my hand, men went to their deaths. I controlled vast armies and had untold wealth at my disposal. Anyone who crossed me was instantly dealt with. No one questioned my authority and lived. Even my sons died when they tried to usurp my throne. I trusted no one. One day I was holding court when some visitors from the east called upon me. They claimed they'd come from a distant land following a star. They were asking me, where is this new king, the star foretold? I was instantly curious. I hid my dismay at this news and calmly told them to come back and tell me where the child was when they found him, so I could go and worship him. They bowed and said they would, and then they left. Immediately, I called the scribes and asked them to look up the scriptures concerning this so-called king and tell me what they said. It didn't take them long. They seemed to know exactly where to look. The scribes told me the child would be born in Bethlehem. The travelers had said they had been journeying for almost two years, so I knew the approximate time of birth. The foreigners never came back, and I knew they had betrayed me. I calculated in my mind what to do. No one would threaten my throne. I would choose my own successor. I would not leave it to some mythical book. King of the Jews, indeed. I was the king of the Jews, not some baby born in Bethlehem. Of all places, surely this was the least important in all Judah. It was laughable. I gathered my elite troops and sent out the edict. Kill all the male children under the age of two. No questions, no mercy. It was for the best. We don't want an insurrection in a few years. We want nothing to upset Rome. I'm the rightful monarch. My word is law. My kingdom will endure.
Through the ages I foresaw this day. Before the foundation of the earth I knew my plan. My son, the prince of glory, would condescend to be born to human parents, to grow up as a normal boy to manhood, to teach and do miracles, to be tempted, tortured, and crucified. Then he would be resurrected, bringing salvation to fallen humankind. All this I preordained. He went willingly, gladly. He knew all that awaited him, but he went eagerly out of love and obedience. How it gladdened my heart when my servant Mary agreed to do my will. She will be called blessed throughout the ages. And Joseph, too, became my willing servant. He scorned his reputation and brought up my son as his own. They gave him a good earthly home. When angels sang announcing Jesus' birth, the heavens rang with joy. The sound of worship filled the earth, and its tumult reached my throne. How I love the simple shepherds that sought him to offer their worship. Their childlike faith will be an example to future believers. And the sages who journeyed far, at great risk and expense, honored me by humbling themselves at my son's feet. How Herod's pride grieved me. How I mourned the death of the innocent babies of Bethlehem. In his arrogance, Herod thought he could thwart my divine plan. But Jesus was born, and he and his family escaped Herod's wrath. Now the world will see the mighty hand of God through God work through Christ, his son. Millions will come to believe in him, and they will be saved. He will take away the sins of the world, and I will reconcile the world to myself through him. And someday every knee will bow on earth and in heaven, And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Will the congregation please rise and join us in singing Joy to the World, number 135.
Now this is where I have my 35 minute sermon. <laughs> and by then it'll be empty. <laughs> anyway, I was thinking today or as we were singing here of a word come. Come. I can re- remember when I was a little boy, my two older brothers who were not angels by any means. I was closer than they were, but I was... <laughs> anyway, um, they would always tell me, come, 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 and I wondered what it was that I had to come to, and I fell in the creek once, and I was... Oh, all the other stuff. Come. The one word from the Bible that really attracted me to the Lord was the word come. And it was not just anyone's name. It was just God the Father saying to us, come. I can remember the time back when my brother was in uh, uh, overseas in the army, Second World War. And I was uh, so anxious for him to come home because I kept hearing of what was happening everywhere else, those who were, were fighting the war. And I just couldn't wait till he came. He came, and finally that day came, and he was home. And I was happy. I was happy. We were all happy. This is Christmas Eve. Tomorrow, we are going to celebrate the truth of the Bible that Jesus did come. He was sent by God the Father. He became the Savior of the world. He he hung on the cross and died for us. And I'm always uh, happy to share that message with anyone. But the realization that Jesus loved me enough, even when I wasn't very lovely and very nice, it just, it did make a difference in my life. So some of you will remember back in the days when you may have been in a Sunday school class as a little person, or you may have been in a a church worshiping and all of a sudden the Lord opened your heart. That's what Christmas is all about. It's not, can you do better than me or can I do better than you? It's just listening to the Father saying to us, come, come. And then he's throwing his arms around you. I think everyone, nearly everyone here tonight, if not everyone here tonight, I have had the opportunity to talk with you and to get to know a little bit about you. And I, I don't remember all the, the, the exact appointments, but the times that we were able to celebrate what God is doing in your life and mine. So tonight, I want to thank you for coming and for being part of this great, wonderful evening of hallelujah music to the Lord Jesus Christ who came to die for us. So it is not, um, God is not interested tonight in what can you do, Tom? What can you do better than somebody else? Uh, What can you say that would make me happy? God is interested in one thing. And that is when he gives you the invitation to come. He is so happy when you make the decision to come. Fifty some years ago, I made that decision as a 17 year old. Have you made that decision just to open your heart to Christ? That's why he came. And we're going to share him this uh, season with our family and our friends. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And the choir, and I think everything was just wonderful tonight. So, thank you. Now we're going to show you a miracle because I'm supposed to light a candle that lights your candle, okay? So if I can light the candle successfully, we're on our way. <laughs>